Thank you for coming together. Thanks for making this happen, Brenda Roberts. Um, You're welcome. This is a courageous conversation around the topic of living with dementia and being a person of color. Um, And I am here to listen, not having dementia and not being a person of color, but I have a group of people out there who tend to be curious about what we put out into the world. And they particularly are really, really supportive of courageous conversations. And we have identified this as one of those courageous conversations that people might be willing to have talking about this intersection of living with a brain change um, that you can't fix um, and being in a community that doesn't like to talk about all that stuff all that much as far as my understanding, but it's a very limited picture. So if you would, tell us a little bit about yourselves to start this off. And then now uh, I'm going to turn it over. Arthena, would you kick us off with a little bit about you? Um, again, my name is Arthena Caston. I live here in Macon, Georgia. I'm quite a busy person, as all of us are. Um, right now, I'm, I got diagnosed with early onset uh, at the age of 51, which was five years and two months ago. Um, so right now, I'm just like I said, I'm really been fortunate because I get to tell my story quite a lot. I serve now with the Georgia uh, Alzheimer's Board of uh, Directors, and I've been fortunate now to just been picked for the National Alzheimer's Board of Directors. So I get to really get around to tell the story a lot. Um, my, my philosophy in life is that I can live joyfully with Alzheimer's, and I speak for those who can't or won't speak for themselves. Thank you. Thanks. That gives us a good sort of, what was your career and what did you do that changed the world before you started developing Alzheimer's disease? If that's the kind of dementia you have, I guess I should ask, did you get diagnosed with Alzheimer's or just young onset dementia? I got, it originally started out with uh, mild cognitive impairment. Okay. And now it's moved into uh, early onset dementia. Okay. So what did you used to do before you got that job? I was, I had worked, I uh, worked for a Geico insurance company for 20 years. Wow. Wow. That's a lot of experience. No, huh? It is. It's a lot of listening to all kinds of stuff. And, uh, it was interesting, I, but I love my job. I love my job because I've always been a people person. I like, like Brito says, I could talk to a door if they would talk back. So when you're dealing with insurance, you are you are definitely listening to people with all kind of issues, all kind of stories, all kind of whatever. And then that's what I did. And I love doing that. Cool. Cool. And so you're still listening to all kinds of people and talking. So cool. Nice. Uh-huh. Nice. Hey, Terry, how about you? Thanks. I will talk you. to you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my name is Terry Montgomery. And I am living with early onset Alzheimer's. I was diagnosed, I was 58 years old. Uh, I'm going into year six of living with this disease. Um, I'm not shaken by it. Initially you are when you first told that diagnosis. Um, as far as what I was doing when I had was diagnosed, I was doing one of the most enjoyable positions ever. And I, my prior career, I did accounting, and I did public management, um, I mean, project management, sales, uh, and um, I had my own accounting business for about 25 years on the side while I was still working. And then um, finally, uh, right before I got my diagnosis, I had only been there for two years when I noticed the changes that I was having. And that was a social worker. So I, I've done so many roles in my life as far as working. Um, and that was um, ended because of my performance of not remembering names and 
being part of doing community service was mm, that was not my role to have. And um, but I really liked helping people and making a difference with the job that I had. And it was um, um, with HUD. Oh, with HUD. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Really making a difference there. Oh, yeah. wow. wow. That's a tough one to lose that. Ouch. Ouch. Because we need yeah. those folks. We really need people who know how to do that. Ouch. 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 Well, yeah. thanks for being here. Yeah. Thank you okay. For having me. Yeah, absolutely. Brian Van Buren. Tell us yeah. a little bit about Brian Van Buren. Brian Van Buren lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. He was I was diagnosed in 2015 with early onset Alzheimer's. I reinvented myself at that point. I was an international flight attendant and I lost my job because of my dementia. Prior to that, I was a licensed neuropsychiatric therapist. And after the loss of my partner, I left my practice and went into the airline business. Wow. I'm an advocate now. I'm a public speaker. Uh, I was just on Good Morning America three weeks ago. So I've been all over the map. Yeah. So, wow. So I didn't know about your original career because you you were an international flight attendant for years. 20 years. Wow. You're sort of like one of those military guys where you have that background and you're sort of like you got that other background before the background. Right. Oh. Well, I was actually in the Navy before that. Wait a minute. Not really. Seriously. Yeah. Yes, I'm a veteran. How old were you? No, I don't want to ask that. But I'm, good Lord, I'm 70 be, now. So are you really? I'm old. Oh, I'm my old. Yes. How have you done that? Look at you. Man, you age I've done. I've done so many things in my career, and I'm not done yet. Yeah, it's real clear you're not done yet. You also are an international host. Yes, I still do. As a matter of fact, I had guests uh, this past weekend. I'm a member of... Uh, Couchsurfing International, and it's an organization very much like Airbnb. People come and ask to stay with you a couple of days and sleep on your couch or your bedroom or wherever. And I have hosted in the last three years 125 guests from all over the world. And my last guest just left uh, Sunday. He was from Peru, Lima, Peru. Wow. Whoa, super cool. Super cool. All right. So now... Having heard a little bit about these amazing folks, um, I want to turn to the question that, you know, I really I want to know how can, I'm a white woman, I'm, you know, I'm not a person of color as far as hit, I've even done genetic code, I haven't got anything but Ireland and England and Scandinavia in there, there's nothing hiding in the bushes that we could work with. I'm originally from West Virginia, which just makes everything more interesting. Um, and now <laughs> live in North Carolina. I'm up the road from Brian. I'm up there in the Chapel Hill area, Durham area. Oh, okay. You're not far. I'm not far. I'm just up the road a little bit. So I'm curious, though, having dementia and being black, what what's special about that, do you think? What's What's unique or special? Anything at all? Well, one of the things I think is unique is that it's not been embraced by the black community at all, mm -hmm. but that's very much like many other diseases. As a matter of fact, uh, an alarming statistic right now is that only 17% of African-Americans have had the vaccine. What and percent? What, what percent? 17%. And yet we make over half of the cases. Oh. Wow. It's just a suspicion of the medical field. People don't trust what's going on. Yeah. Due to um, the um, Tuskegee study, and mm -hmm. recently there was a situation in North Carolina where they were sterilizing women against their will. So yeah. I guess there's a right to have suspicion about what's going on with the medical field. And the reality is they don't really treat African-Americans the same way they treat the normal population. They mm -hmm. kind of dismiss many things that uh, we try to talk about or discuss and bring up. So I'm not sure how to change it. Yeah. So so what I hear you say, Brian, within the community, there is huge distrust for the, the medical profession, which is largely not 
or would you say largely or generally not considered part of the African-American culture? Or there's a certain group, but what do you, but there are people who are African-American who are doctors and nurses and care providers. And Actually, only 10% of the population, African-American population are, in the, are, are doctors. Oh, okay. So there's not very much. So not very it's many. a lot easier. Okay. No, it's a lot easier to get a diagnosis from someone who looks like you Mm-hmm. as opposed to a white person giving this diagnosis and not really having much empathy. Um, and the sad thing is I think a lot of these doctors aren't really educated when it comes to dementia and Alzheimer's. Mm-hmm. And once they diagnose you, they just kind of send you home to die. They give you no referrals, no cons- nothing. And uh, mm-hmm. you're kind of left on your own to try to find your way. Do you think it's worse if you're African American than if you're white? Because I've heard the same kind of stories from other friends of mine who are, you know, who are living with dementia, who were basically said, "Well, you get, need to get your affairs in order, and you need to quit doing things, and because you're yes. not going to be around much." I mean, so is it worse though if you're a person of color? You Absolutely. Think? Okay. Yes. Would you agree, Terry? I, I absolutely. I think that um, first of all, you have the stigma on the disease anyway, and then when you're black, so there's two stigmas. Stigma number one: you're lazy. You really don't have that. You don't look like that. You, you're missing doctors' appointments, or there's not proper insurance within some communities. They're uninsured. When you have the Affordable Care Act. There's many places that you can't go. Then it gets worse when you have the disease and people talk to you like you are something that's not right because they're biased. They're looking at you first. You can't have what we think you have, which all of us go through that. But you are immediately questioned whether or not there's something wrong with you. But secondly, you need to be able to go to a doctor that will work with you and not assume, not put words in your mouth. You're talking to them. You don't have to feel, if I'm telling you how I feel, how I'm forgetting, but you're feeding back to me that maybe it's hormonal, maybe it could be your thyroid, or maybe it's just you're too young. That's all good. But then some people do not like going back to the doctors because the doctors have said something like that. So they ride on that and they may not come back. Or they may not have the insurance or the coverage because they're unemployed or they're sick of all of the things that are out there for minorities. Not to say that they're looking for any handouts or anything like that, but just the services that you have. I'll use myself, for example. I not only had, um, and 15 was I diagnosed with the the, uh, early onset Alzheimer's. But in 16 and 17, back to back, I had a breast cancer diagnosis. And when I got that first diagnosis, you know what the doctor said? I had a history of of, of breast cancer from on my mom's side. The cancer that I had in that breast, because that's all I knew was the left breast, over 50% of that breast was bad. But the recommendation was to give me a lapectomy instead of removing the oh, whole thing. Oh, they would never so make that recommendation. if anybody knows yeah. this walk, yeah. I walk. That's, yeah. And when you're told that whether it's through the health system that limits what can be done or whether you maybe you don't have enough intelligence to have that done, but you're all, there's always so many opinions of that. In my case, I got a second opinion. When I went to that second opinion, because it didn't make sense for me to have someone do a lipectomy, remove part of that breast. Now I have a deformity. They have to do reconstruction on both sides. That's crazy. Why won't you remove the whole thing? So when I went to another location and got a second opinion, there was they did all the tests over and there was cancer. It's the following year. And my right breast, they did a total bilateral mastectomy. They didn't argue with me at all. But I had to stand up and say that my quality of life, I still can talk. I still can uh, get through this disease right now to give me a chance. And that's what people of color has to ask 
doctors have to push for you if you have another diagnosis. And then as far as you've been given a diagnosis, there's nothing to talk to you about nutrition, popular nutrition, exercise, all of those things that they normally tell you for your high blood pressure. Well, they need to tell you that to come back on this disease that we ha don't have any clue. Sure. And I'm going to stop there. <laughs> well, no, I mean, what you, yeah, that's good. I, you know, you don't need to stop there, but I love, okay. I mean, I love how much you've been able to like put out there in one little bucket. So we've got, you've got being a woman into the healthcare system. We have being a woman who's relatively young. I mean, right. Really looking young also on top of it all. Congratulations for looking very young. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yes, I guess. I don't know. Maybe it's not as helpful, but having a condition where you are living with brain change and your brain change is a dementia and there is no going back from that. You get that, but there is life after that. And you didn't get any exactly. support for that. You didn't get any guidance on here's some things you could do that would reduce risk. This is where you want to be thoughtful. This is where you want to really look at how you're managing these things and wanting to really be thoughtful and careful about that. Then you get another condition that runs in the family. You know, it runs in the family, uh, a breast cancer that spreads relatively quickly in the family. And so not getting good support because what would be the point? We'll just do a lumpectomy and that should be enough to hold you because you've got dementia. And having to be your own strong advocate for an incredibly hard procedure to go through, and yet knowing it gives you the best chance for a better quality life, living with your dementia for a period of time, because you're not done, you're not finished, you're not going to go away in the next year or two. So it's not like a quick band-aid because, well, she's not going to be here long. Ouch. So I'm now curious, how much support from the African-American community that you're a member of did you get for doing that? A lot of support because I educated them. Another thing, before they was going to give me the lipectomy, I was diagnosed that November. I would not be allowed or scheduled to get that lipectomy to get the cancer removed right. until February. February. So the system is broken, no matter what color, but I'm just saying that I, I think that because I was the color that I was, there wasn't an urgency to take care of that. Yeah. Ouch. And, um, and so. That's not it, good. I mean, ugh, good. yuck. I mean, that whole thing, that, that's wrong. And so I'm going to come back around with all your thoughts about change. But Arthena, what about your experience? of being a, a woman of color and being diagnosed with dementia? I think uh, as Brian and Terry has said both, I think this starts not only, I listened to both of their opinions about it, but again, this a lot of this starts again in the home and it starts way, way back in the home. Um, um, we all know, we all know as African-Americans, this started um, when um, people, when we were children, our parents always told us, what's done in my house better stay in my house. So with that being said, um, if it's done in my house to stay in my house, I uh, look at uh, even friends of mine now who are suffering or who have parents or grandparents who are suffering from Alzheimer's or uh, dementia, uh, they seem like they think that it's a natural part of aging mm -hmm. because it's a natural part of aging. It's okay for grandma to sit in front of the TV all day and watch Leave it to Beaver. It's okay. It's okay for them to, for you to feed them. You're taking care of them. You're feeding them. You're changing their clothes. And they automatically think this is a part of aging. Well, now I'm looking at younger people who are friends of mine, who have parents and stuff who now are in the house and they're saying, I just want to get my grandma some help. Well, 
um, my father had Alzheimer's. Six of his brothers and sisters had Alzheimer's. But because we were a little different and we were not just letting them sit in the house, we were trying to find things for them to do or whatever the case is, it was handled a little differently. Well, of course, uh, my father and all his sisters and brothers got it when they were in their late 60s, early 70s. For me, I got it at 51. So it was a little different. In fact, it was a lot different. But I still got the very same, the very same thing was told to me when I went to the doctor to say, I have a problem. Well, the first two years, every time I went to my doctor, he kept saying, I think you're going through menopause. I think that you're having a thyroid issue. You know, and this kept going on and on and on until I actually asked to see a different type of doctor. I wonder to him and I even, you know, he's still my doctor as, as my primary care physician. But when he finally sent me over to a neuropsychiatrist and I finally got the, the diagnosis. So after almost three years, I just constantly think it took me three years to tell me this, this whole time this was going on. But I wonder, you know, with him, I don't, I don't fault him because I don't know if he couldn't see it because I was so young or because I had been a patient of his for 18 years and he didn't want to see that. But once I got to the different doctors, the next time I saw the neurologist, the only thing he had to tell me was the first time he got the diagnosis was, I think you need to go home and get your house in order. I was 51 years old. I think you need to go home and get your house in order. And I talked to friends of mine, I mean, uh, to, with the different groups that I'm in, and they all say the same thing. The doctor always say to them, go home and get your house in order. You need to go ahead and, you know, make sure that everything is put in place. And so for you to tell a person who's 51 or 52 or whatever age, that's a young age, that this is what the situation is, even as them being Caucasian doctors, all the doctors I've dealt with so far have been Caucasian doctors. Um, you know, I kind of faulted one. He didn't even, when I went to see him the second time, he didn't even ask me, not one time did he say, not one time did he ask anything about how I was doing. He didn't ask anything about my dementia. He didn't ask anything about the Alzheimer's, nothing, nothing, until I fought, brought it to him and said, you know, I take my husband with me everywhere I go when I'm going to see a doctor that has to deal with my neurologist or anything that has to do with my neurology. And he always asked the questions. He didn't even, he didn't even introduce himself to my husband or say, you know, Mr. Caston, how are you? Or so forth and so on until I brought up the subject. So my thought was, if you had had a Caucasian person come into your office, would you have done that? Would you had not even acknowledged the number one, the husband? Would you not have even said to him, let me help you or let me you know, ask you, how is she doing? He's my main uh, care partner. He's there with me more than, you know, he's going to remember things that I don't remember. So, you know, what we sit back and we look at it and we think about, oh my gosh, is this really happening? This is why, this is why the main reason why we as African-Americans don't reach out to going to doctors. You know, Terry made a great thing when he said about the insurance and so forth, and we can't afford it and things. But even if we could afford it, if we went to a doctor, is he going to treat me the same way that he treats everyone else? Is he? No, he's not. It's, his whole thing is, I think it starts, and I if I, if I could speak to doctors, I would say, you all need to start your care in medical school. You need to start learning how to talk to a person who has been diagnosed because if you and my husband has always said this, if I had taken from the very first time with that diagnosis, which I did for the first, I think month or so, I didn't want anybody to know. I was just like, oh my God, this can't be happening to me. I'm 51. You've told me I'm going to be dying in five to eight years. That's what you told me. That's what you said. I give you five to eight years to live. Well, if I had taken that, that five to eight years, I've, I've reached a five-year limit right now. If you have told me and I just went with it, right now, I'd have been laying in my bed watching uh, Leave the Beaver. I would have because I would have just given up all hope. I really would have. But, you know, I kind of just thought to myself, I can do better than this. Yeah. You know, I'm going to tell people, like I said, I, I speak for those who can't speak for themselves. 
And people need that. They need that extra help, that extra push, that extra saying, this is not a disease that you're just going to lay down with. Hey folks, thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to help us spread Teeps' positive approach message around the world. And don't forget to click the bell to get notified when new videos are posted.